Uh, the next speaker is um, Giulia Baccalini, who is from the University of Bologna, and she is in the Laboratory of Immunology, directed by Professor Claudio Franceschi. Um, and she's going to talk to us about her work um, that she's been doing for quite a while, looking at um, epigenome, the epigenome in, um, in aging. So thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for arranging a such uh, uh, a successful meeting. And the aim of my presentation is to give you a general overview of the conceptual framework on which uh, the research in our lab is based, and to provide you some examples uh, of the most uh, recent results uh, that are currently, uh, the most recent experiments that are currently ongoing. So our study starts uh, several years ago, in the late 90s. And in this period, uh, Franceschi's lab was studying basically two topics. On one side, oh, sorry. On one side, the evolution of the immune systems from invertebrates to mammals. And these studies suggested that uh, the immune responses, the inflammation responses, and the stress responses are all part of uh, the same set of highly integrated evolutionary conserved, uh, evolutionary conserved functions in which the macrophage plays a central role. And on the other side, the lab was studying the immunosenescence, and this study revealed that not all the immune responses decline with aging, and that, for example, some responses, like the ability to mount inflammation, can be increased in the, in the elderly. By merging these two, uh, two kinds of investigation, in 2000, the lab proposed for the first time the term inflammaging, to indicate the low-grade chronic inflammation that occurs with aging, and that can be related to the, develop, the onset and the development of uh, age-related diseases. So what are the stressors that uh, fuel inflammaging? Uh, let's say in the, the first version of the theory, uh, great attention was uh, um, uh, on the persistent viral infections that occur lifelong. But uh, it was soon realized that uh, probably a large part of this stressor uh, actually come uh, from within, and are the results of several uh, mechanisms that occur in the, within the cells, and that lead with aging to uh, the accumulation of uh, cellular debris, misfolded self molecules, and misplaced self molecules that uh, actually act as pro inflammatory uh, compounds. Uh, importantly, inflammaging has been recently recogni recognized as one of the seven pillars of aging. So according to this new view, which is called the Giro Science, age, uh, is, aging is based on a limited set of highly interconnected mechanisms. And the important thing is that these mechanisms are at the basis not only of aging, but also of age-related diseases. So the GeroScience approach recognizes that aging is the common background of age-related diseases, and that uh, age-related diseases can be, can be considered as a, a deviation from the normal aging trajectories, so a sort of uh, accelerated aging. And this means that if we understand the mechanism of aging, we understand also the mechanisms of age-related diseases, and we will be able to combat them all together in a comprehensive way, rather than one by one. Uh, in the study of the mechanism of uh, aging and age-related diseases, uh, our lab has uh, uh, put a great effort uh, to study what is somehow the other side of the coin, which is the successful aging of, uh, of centenarians. Uh, centenarians are for sure the best model of human longevity, as uh, we saw yesterday also with the presentation of Professor Perls, uh, as they avoided or largely postponed the major age-related diseases. So on the basis of what we have said so far, we, we would expect that inflammation is low in centenarians. But when uh, we and other groups measured the level of uh, pro-inflammatory molecules circulating 
in the blood of centenarians in the plasma, uh, we observed that indeed uh, this, uh, that actually these molecules uh, were high. These, for example, are the levels uh, of interleukin-6 in our cohort of centenarians, and as you can see, they are significantly higher compared to a group of old people. So how can we explain this, uh, this paradox? Uh, a possible explanation is that, uh, okay, centenarians have high levels of circulating pro-inflammatory molecules, but at the same time, they also have high levels of anti-inflammatory molecules. Uh, for example, these are the levels of adiponectin in our cohort, and they are significantly higher in centenarians compared to, to the old group. So we have to add a piece, let's say, to our conceptual framework and consider the continuous balance between inflammaging and anti-inflammaging, which occurs during the life of, the, of an individual. And uh, um, the balance uh, between inflammaging and anti-inflammaging influences the outcome of the aging process, if successful, like for centenarians, or unsuccessful, which, lead, which leads to the development of age-related diseases. And at this point, we have to add uh, another piece and to inquadrate uh, aging, uh, inflammaging and anti-inflammaging in a view of aging which is uh, multidimensional. That is, we have to take into account the temporal dimension and the spatial dimension. Uh, what does this mean? Starting from the temporal dimension, what we have to take into account is that each individual has an immunobiography. And this immunobiography derives from uh, forces that operate at different levels. We have got uh, an evolutionary level, which operates at wider time scales, from hundreds to thousands of years, and operates at the levels of populations. And this means that all the individuals that belong to the same population have the same immunobiographical background. And then we have the ontogenic level, which is the level specific of an individual, uh, uh, which depends on uh, his uh, uh, exposure to stressors during his life, starting from the in utero period until the end of his life. And of course, uh, the environment that he experienced can change during his life. And also, we have to consider that individuals that were born in different birth courts experience different environment during, uh, during their life. Regarding the uh, spatial dimension, what we have to take into account is the relationship between systemic and local inflammation. Uh, we have just said that in the plasma of centenarians, the levels of interleukin-6 are high. But when we measure the levels of interleukin-6 in fibroblasts from uh, uh, dermal biopsies of people of different ages, this is what we, we observed. So the interleukin-6 levels, both for the expression of the RNA and the levels of the protein in the culture, in the sarcantans, were high in the fibroblasts from old people, but they were low in the fibroblasts from centenarians at levels comparable to those of young subjects. And this means that the centenarians have high level of interleukin-6 at a systemic level, but low level at a local level, at least for the, for the fibroblasts. And another thing that we have to take into account is the propagation of the inflammation. This is an experiment that we just performed in the lab. So we cultured the fibroblasts from young, old centenarian subjects. We took the sarcantans of the cells and we isolated exosomes. And then we put the same number of exosomes from these, people, from these fibroblast cultures uh, in, into a, a culture of macrophage. And we measured the expression of interleukin-6 in this macrophage. And this is the pattern that we observed. So uh, the interleukin-6 expression was high in the uh, macrophages exposed to the old exosomes, but was low in the, mac in the macrophage exposed to the centenarians' exosomes, at levels comparable to those of the macrophage exposed to the young exosomes. And if you remember, this pattern is exactly the same pattern of interleukin-6 expression that we observed in the original culture of fibroblasts. 
And this means that uh, the pattern of inflammation can uh, propagate from the fibroblast to the macrophage, in this case, in this case through, through exosomes. So we have to rethink to uh, aging, anti-inflammaging, inf inflammaging as uh, uh, propagatory processes. So they originate within the cells as a consequence of several mechanisms, as we have said, and then can they can, can propagate locally within the niche or systemically through the, the bloodstream. So uh, the scenario is uh, really complex as we have uh, several tissues, uh, organs, uh, systems, uh, and also ecosystems uh, like the gut microbiota that can contribute uh, to the balance between inflammaging and anti-inflammaging uh, with uh, local and systemic effects uh, during the life of an individual taking, to, in, taking into account his uh, uh, immunobiographical background. And what we are currently doing in the lab is to analyze this complex scenario uh, through different uh, omic approaches in order to characterize the molecular change that uh, occur in aging, age-related diseases, and uh, longevity, with the hope uh, at the end of having, of, of having an, an integrated view of uh, what's happening. Uh, this uh, is an overview of the omic characterizations that are currently ongoing. Of course, I, I will not describe all of them. I just want to say something regarding the metagenomics and the epigenomics studies. So regarding the metagenomics studies, we have used uh, both microarray and the next generation sequencing to analyze the gut microbiota from people ranging from 22 to 109 years. And uh, this is the longest available human microbiota trajectory analyzed so far. And we have uh, um, identified several changes that occur with aging. Uh, for example, a decrease in the bacteria that produce uh, uh, short-chain fatty acids, an increase uh, in the opportunistic bacteria, which, has, which are pro-inflammatory, and also an increase in bacteria that use uh, tryptophan. And this fits uh, with the observation in the same cohort of a decrease of the levels of tryptophan in plasma with aging. And you know tryptophan is very important for uh, cognitive function, so it, it can, be can be related to a cognitive decline with, uh, with aging. And then we look at uh, the centenarians. So as you can see, we have uh, uh, some changes uh, that are exactly those observed uh, with aging, but uh, specifically in the group of centenarians, uh, we observed an increase in bacteria that can have uh, a positive impact uh, on uh, uh, the uh, immunological and metabolic, uh, immunological, sorry, and metabolic functions. And the nice thing is that uh, um, for some of these taxa, uh, like those uh, um, in bold. Um, there was published the, uh, recently an independent study, this one, uh, on a court uh, of Chinese centenarians, and they found exactly the same taxa involved in longevity. And this means that uh, despite the, the evident differences in uh, uh, diet and environment between Italy and China, and China there is a common core of change in gut microbiota that uh, can be associated to, to longevity. Okay, regarding the epigenetic studies, we've made a large use of the Infinium microarray from Illumina. It allows to analyze more than uh, 480,000 CPG sites across the genome. And we applied this microarray to study the Italian centenarians, actually semi-supercentenarians, compared to their offsprings, and uh, age-matched con controls. And as you can see here, we introduced the offspring model uh, because uh, the offspring of centenarians uh, are potentially a highly informative model to study the trajectories of uh, healthy aging uh, as they share with centenarians uh, partially the genetics and also partially the environment and, uh, and the lifestyle. And uh, indeed, we recently published a paper uh, which, in which we demonstrated that for several aspects, uh, the offspring of centenarians are healthier compared to the, the age-matched control, controls. And the analysis of this, uh, on this data set is currently ongoing. 
But in the meanwhile, we have used uh, the Horvath's epigenetic clock on this data set. Uh, the Horvath's clock uh, is uh, basically a multi-tissue predictor of aging. So it's based on the methylation status of uh, 353 uh, CPG sites, starting from the methylation of these sites. It, can, uh, it returns a value, uh, which is the, the epigenetic age of an individual, and generally this is uh, highly correlated with uh, the chronological age. But the clock has been demonstrated to be able to detect also age acceleration effects uh, related to age-related diseases like uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson, and also obesity. And these are the results of the clock on our course. So as you can see, the uh, centenarians, which are in red, have uh, an epigenetic age which is uh, uh, lower than expected, but not only. We observed uh, that also the offspring of centenarians, which are uh, in orange, are epigenetically younger compared to uh, the age-matched contro controls. And this suggests that a delay in the epigenetic aging can contribute to healthy aging and, uh, and to longevity. Uh, we use the same approach on a court of uh, uh, subjects affected by Down syndrome. As you know, Down syndrome can have a wide range of uh, uh, clinical manifestations, and uh, for some uh, aspects, it resembles an accelerating uh, aging disease. Uh, which affects uh, in particular the immune system and the central nervous system with uh, an increase in cognitive impairment and uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these are the results of the Orvat clock on uh, persons with Down syndrome, which are in red. And as you see, we observed an increase, an acceleration in their epigenetic age, in blood, in lymphocytes, and also in, uh, in brain tissue. And we use the, this data set to perform also a differentially methylated, uh, an analysis of differential methylation. So we uh, identified a short set of uh, differentially methylated regions, uh, which uh, uh, are indeed a signature of the disease and allows to distinguish perfectly uh, the persons with Down syndrome in green compared uh, respect to the, to the controls. And uh, when uh, we look at the genes uh, involved in the, including in the, in the signature, we found uh, several interesting hints. Uh, in particular, one of the pathway that was more enriched was the phosphinocytide 3 kinase AKT pathway that you know is really important in aging and in age-related diseases, including Alzheimer's. And we also found uh, several genes that are involved in hematopoiesis and in neuronal development. So the two districts that are most affected by the age-related uh, phenotype. To analyze this data set, we used a bioinformatic approach that we specifically set up for this kind of, of microarray. Uh, basically, it allows to identify differentially methylated regions, that is, uh, genomic regions in which there are multiple adjacent CPG sites, which show a differential methylation between the group under investigation. And we demonstrated that this approach is uh, um, quite effective in highlighting the biological relevant results. And we applied this approach to perform a meta-analysis of the DNA methylation changes that occur in blood uh, with age. And uh, also in this case, uh, we found a short signature of differentially methylated regions. And uh, the, the king, let's say, of this uh, signature if, is for sure the E-level 2 gene. Um, basically, it has uh, differentially methylated regions in the CPG island at the promoter. And the CPG, the CPG sites in this region show basically in blood uh, a change in the methylation, which goes from 0% to 100%, from 0 to 100 years. So it's a very uh, high correlation with, uh, with age. And uh, uh, we demonstrated recently that E level 2 methylation, hypermethylation with age, is uh, almost systemic, so it, it occurs uh, in uh, most of the tissues that we analyzed, but also in this case we have uh, local effects, 
And uh, as you can see, for example, the methylation of the region doesn't change at all in uh, cerebellum. Uh, the gene encodes uh, for an enzyme which is involved uh, in the synthesis uh, of uh, omega-3. And it has been recently demonstrated that uh, in the knockout mice, uh, the levels uh, of the DHA are very low. And uh, that in this, mace, in this mice, the uh, polarization of macrophages is affected. So the macrophages show a more pro-inflammatory uh, phenotype. And uh, um, DHA is one of the precursors of uh, the pro-resolving uh, uh, molecules like, re like resolvins and uh, uh, maricins. And in the next months, we would like to assess if there is a relationship between the hypermethylation of E level 2 with uh, aging, a possible decrease in its expression, and uh, a decrease in the ability to resolve inflammation, which, of course, uh, which can occur uh, with, uh, with aging. Uh, just a few words uh, regarding the uh, two of the projects that are currently ongoing in the lab. They are called uh, Propagaging and the Age. They are both uh, European founded projects. Uh, propagaging is on Parkinson's disease and the uh, age is on Alzheimer's disease. But both the projects share the same uh, um, conceptual uh, structure, let's say, which is the summary of uh, what we have said so far. So their aim is to use uh, different omics to, uh, to analyze samples from centenarians compared to samples from Alzheimer or Parkinson's patients and identify in this way the uh, molecular changes that are responsible for a deviation of the trajectories from the healthy aging of centenarians towards the unsuccessful aging of uh, Alzheimer and uh, Parkinson's disease patient. And uh, we are very proud to have very good collaborators, both uh, uh, for the clinical aspects that will provide uh, the samples and for the experimental uh, analysis. And I would like to thank you for your attention and of course the, the members of our group in, uh, in Bologna.